Well, as you heard the reading from Isaiah contrasts two different ways that God has made and will make. The first way in verse 16 speaks of a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, which refers to the annihilation of the Egyptians in the Red Sea as they were pursuing the Israelites to prevent them from leaving Egypt. And the second way is in verse 19 where God says, I'm about to do a new thing. See, it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The first is a way of death and destruction. The second is a life-giving path forward through the wilderness. Water in the desert. Water which is essential for life. And it seems to me that this is often how we characterize or view God the death-dealing avenger, or the life-giving savior. Is it any wonder then that we try to do the same thing with Jesus? Well, our theme for these contemporary services has been freeing Jesus based on Diana Butler Bass's book by the same name. And in it she writes, throughout the New Testament, Jesus invites people to follow him, to walk with him, to go on a journey. And there's nothing particularly new in this as the Hebrew scriptures are full of stories of wanderers, pilgrims, exiles, and immigrants. And of course, in the ancient world, teachers of all sorts, gurus, prophets, healers, mystics, gathered followers, those who embraced the master's message and put it into everyday practice. However, in the Gospel of John, she writes Jesus up the theological ante. He not only taught a way of inviting the curious to follow him. But he said he was the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. And that's a beautiful verse, poetic and parabolic image of the way and the way, a beckoning for all who know Jesus to willingly embrace the journey. That is the path, the road of liberation. And it would be freeing, but for the next sentence. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wait, what? The welcome's pulled back, boundaries are put up, and suddenly the picture shifts as the call to dance and sing and run through the fields fades into a rather grim image of judgment and exclusion. This is what is sometimes called, she says, a clobber verse. In some Christian circles, if you dare wonder aloud if Jews, Buddhists, or secular people will be in heaven, a concerned friend will pull out this verse, smashing his words into the conversation to shut you up as surely as if wielding a weapon. The emphasis is not on the first half of the verse, way, truth, and life, but the second half, where the weight falls on no one and except through me. The way is not a way at all. Rather, it's a circumscribed sheep pen with fences of razor wire. There's one way in, and the other way out means hell. She continues, many Christians cling ferociously to the exclusionary interpretation of this verse. About a dozen years ago, she relates, I was leading a retreat based on the themes, way, truth, and life. I hope to shake up attendees by taking the verse out of its typical frame of proof texting, Christian exclusion. Instead, she says, I wanted to explore spiritual practices, the way, authenticity and integrity, the truth, and abundance and joy, life. At the first session, she says, I had decided to offer a reflection on John 14, verse 6, inviting the attendees to open their spiritual imaginations to hear the words differently. I requested that the event organizer tell whoever was assigned to read that passage to stop after the word life, to allow the group's attention to rest solely on that first sentence of the verse. We sang and prayed, and then the reader rose and read, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. 
How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Bass says, I stood up and approached the pulpit to preach, but the reader kept right on going. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And the reader looked up from the text, says Bass, and glared at me, still standing, Bible open. Well, I said, trying to make a joke of it, I'd wanted the reading to end halfway through verse 6. I guess my message didn't get through. Still standing, the woman replied, Oh no, that was the instruction. But I didn't want to do it. You have to have the second part. Jesus is the only way. That's the whole point. And she shut her Bible and pulled it close to her chest as if it were a shield, and she sat down, heaving a contemptuous sigh. During the retreat, Bass says, I went on to emphasize that way, truth, and life are relational words. All things that Jesus says he is. Way is not a technique or a map. Truth is not about philosophy or dogma. And life is not about going to heaven. In the mystical poetry of John, Jesus uses these items to explain how he embodies a way of being in this world, so close to the heart of God that God can be known in and through Jesus. Well, we're nearing the end of Lent, and the story from our Gospel reading today of Mary's anointing of Jesus also reflects the conflict between two opposing views of who Jesus is to be. Judas Iscariot had a vision of a military leader who would take back the country through a divinely sanctioned war. While Mary was able to relate, embrace Jesus' message that nonviolence was the only way ahead, even if it meant his own death by the extremely cruel methods of the Roman Empire. So out of love, she anoints his body for burial in an act that can't be understand, understood through those who see only the waste of a very expensive gift, a gift that could have been better used perhaps to feed the hungry. But Jesus asks them and us to look beyond the concerns of this world and see that Mary is ministering to him and shouldn't be criticized for doing so. What the many people who hold the vengeful image of God cannot or will not see is that the way of Jesus is the way of love. It's also like a labyrinth. And if you've ever walked one, you'll know it's a meandering but purposeful path from the edge to the center and back again. Jesus isn't a Trans-Canada highway to glory. The Jesus way, just like life, is full of switchbacks and spirals and unexpected turns, mystery, paradox, unknowing, unsaying. And whenever you think that you're near the center, the path suddenly veers in a different direction and you find yourself once again at the edge of the way. No wonder Jesus says, follow me and I am the way. But for having a guide, you might never find a path even if sometimes you're only following the breadcrumbs he left behind. Mary's anointing is presented in John as a sign of Jesus' kingship and as a public announcement of Jesus' sovereignty. Kings and priests were anointed. The sick were also anointed because the oil was thought to have both medicinal and sacred effects. The dead were anointed for burial as a ritual sign of cleansing. These many moments of anointing with oil suggest that what Mary did could have many interpretations. Royalty, ruler, healing, soothing, death, cleansing, preparation, honor, or love. Verse 7 suggests the connection with Mary's anointing and Jesus' forthcoming burial. She's preparing Jesus' body for entombment, which will occur in a week's time. Jesus has spoken of his climactic hour throughout John's gospel. And that hour is coming swiftly. And Mary's actions prepare us for that hour in which Jesus will be glorified by being lifted up on a cross. In his brutal dying will also at the same time be his grand exaltation. Mary's anointing anticipates the event in which Jesus will teach his disciples about the true nature of discipleship. Mary wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, just as Jesus will wipe his disciples' feet 
with a towel tied around his body. When Jesus washes feet, he tells his disciple that he has done this as an example to them, an example that they are to follow. Mary's already led the way with her anointing of Jesus even before Jesus taught her about the way of discipleship. Jesus suggests an additional meaning of this anointing. In Israel, dead bodies were cleansed and anointed for burial. She's anointing me in preparation for my death, says Jesus. A king who dies? We erect bronze statues of kings in order to show that royalty is eternal, permanently in power. This king whom Mary anoints goes to his death. We sometimes don't know what to think about Jesus. Maybe we're attracted to him because we believe that he had the power to fix what's wrong with us or the world. But Jesus proved not to be effective, as we judge effectiveness. In his suffering, dying, and willingness to be betrayed, he just didn't match up to our expectations of how God ought to act, if God were truly the God we expected. And as Jesus goes to his crucifixion, there on a cross to dramatically rearrange our notions of God, power, love, and death. He gathers with his close friends. Some of them adoringly worship him. Others roll up their sleeves and serve him. And some betray and forsake him. Mary, Martha, Judas, all with Jesus. So here we are, the fifth Sunday of Lent, and on our way with Jesus to the cross, In just a short time, we'll stand at the foot of a cross and we'll look up at him in his final agony. It's not the God that we expected. It's not how we presumed that he would establish his reign. It's hard to know what to think. But maybe faith is not a matter of getting your ideas right about Jesus or thinking the right things about Jesus. It's simply to be with Jesus. And in the light of today's gospel, the story of Mary, Martha, Judah, Judas, and Jesus, the most important actor is Jesus. Jesus has chosen to spend his last hours of earthly life with his friends, some of whom now know how to love him, some of them who don't. Faith is being with Jesus as you are, rather than what you are supposed to be, to go ahead and to love him, Sing songs, praise him, or go and go forth from here and work with him and for him to serve him and the way of love. Thanks be to God. Amen.